Howard Zlamo here. I'm a part-time faculty for Arizona LEND. LEND stands for Leadership and Education for Neurodevelopmental Disabilities. So I present on autism spectrum disorders. That's one of my specialties. I would describe what I have more as a syndrome or a condition because I don't feel that it uh, disables me from too many things. A little bit of socializing, but I feel like I'm... Uh, that I'm able to close the deficits there at least quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> so I would say that it's a condition or a syndrome. Medically, I don't consider it that much of a difference medically, except maybe just a little different wiring in my brain. Um, and also, I don't feel at least at this point that it really affects my health. Asperger syndrome. I don't think uh, I don't think that they use that term as, as much anymore because they, they just mention it like as a as a very mild case of autism. Um, I think in some ways is handling large crowds because I never know where I'm supposed to go or I'm not supposed to go. I feel I've gotten better about that over the years, but still can be kind of difficult. Or who to trust, whom not to trust. Okay or when to stand my ground or when to actually trust the person. It's a little tough mm -hmm. and or even very tough, I would say. Also recognizing nonverbal cues. I'm still, um, I'm still working on that quite a bit. I remember having a car accident in 2014 and there were several things, but the thing that stood out to me the most was I was in the ambulance and it was after a head on collision. And the guy in the ambulance and the paramedics said that it was a single vehicle crash. And I was like looking at him like, it was two vehicles, you idiot. Like what I just said. He's like, I corrected myself over the radio, thank you. I mean, I was just so mad. My hands were all tied down and everything. And, and I didn't want to be arrogant. I remember that day just being very angry. And I know the doctors and everybody were helping me. And I didn't like being in that hospital. I just want to get out of there as quickly as I darn well could. But basically, if the doctors and the officers were all to come together to talk about me, they probably would have noticed me as uh, angry, maybe even slightly arrogant. And he watches every single thing about me. Howard, your cholesterol is a little too high. Lose some weight. You know, things like that. So I know he cares. I thank my lucky stars that I've had no significant hospital stays because I know that they're good nurses and I know that they're bad nurses. So luckily I haven't had any significant uh, issues with any nurses. Thank you. Bye. My name is Kirby Sickman. I am a special education teacher at Accelerated Learning Laboratories. Um, I require, I, sorry, I acquired a brain injury of November 16th, 2006. And I was in a coma for like three and a half weeks. And when I woke up, I had to relearn how to swallow water, swallow food, wipe my butt, um, do my hair, uh, take care of myself. I had to relearn all that. And so I thought I would apply those since like double kind of life skills. Um, I thought I would take my secondary knowledge of these life skills and apply them to special education. So I was my class president, so I was always real involved with the special education world. And then my coma happened, and then instantly I became a member of special education. But it's okay, because I mean, in a matter of three months, the class president goes from being the class president to a guy being followed with a paraprofessional, listening to headphones and, oh yeah, oh. traumatic brain injury case. So. The relearning of the skills and re retraining myself to find, because my brain, I'm, I'm not, I don't think on the same path, and I, like, I, all my interests and everything are totally different now than they used to be. Not bad, just difficult for me in the healthcare. Um, there was, there's been a series of times where I've had to go to rehabilitation clinics, and there was this one time, um, this rehab center over in California, that I mean. They did wonders for me. I came so far from having been at that place, but I, but they, my insurance stopped paying, and I was making such good progress. And especially now, I look back at like my recovery, and that's where a big, a 
like a big catapult happening as far as like getting to where I can take care of myself. My my doctor from day one for my traumatic brain injury, uh, Dr. Sidney Rice, has been full fledged, uh, like a I'm not religious, but like a guardian angel. Um, she's looked after, made sure that I've been taken care of throughout this whole process. I'm, I'm not one of those people, and I'm not going to say, like, no, it's ability, because I know that my thinking is not this. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying it's right, good, wrong. It, 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 disability is not disabled. It's, it just means you just got different means to get stuff done. Thanks. Matt Randall. Uh, I'm an attorney here in Tucson, Arizona. I own and run my own law firm, primarily family law. Um, I served in the United States Army for just under five years uh, on a four-year contract. Uh, I fought in Iraq during the invasion in 2003. I was actually a combat medic. I got to do significantly more under the license of the doctor I practiced under um, than a paramedic might normally, et cetera. Uh, as a result of my service and, and some of the struggles, I have been diagnosed by the VA uh, as uh, disabled 40%, but primarily my diagnosis is post-traumatic stress disorder um, with the sort of comorbid or sub-diagnosis of uh, depression and anxiety. Um, and there are now over 2 million individuals that have deployed and fought in Iraq and Afghanistan since 2001, uh, folks are surviving things that they would have never survived before. And so you're going to get this big diaspora bubble pop uh, because of our continued conflicts. And so I think the students are going to, in their careers, be dealing with uh, us and, and these things far more. Um, you wouldn't necessarily, in the stereotypical observation, presume uh, that I am disabled in any manner. Uh, much of my, when you say challenges with the medical system on the front end, um, are or have been accessing care timely. Um, I'm going to give an example that I went to a gastro appointment um, and the doctor's staff didn't let me know that they were running over an hour behind. Um, because my PTSD is related to uh, practicing medicine, um, my anxiety uh, is uh, exacerbated when in a medical setting. The longer I waited with no answer, uh, the more that grew. I know my body. I know my affects. I know what's going on for me, good or bad, better than anybody. So I have had uh, treating physicians or psychiatric care folks that want to tell me what's going on for me. Uh, and that's incredibly frustrating and the, the feeling of dismissiveness uh, is, is not enjoyable. My wife uh, is regularly with me at my appointments because I don't often recognize when I'm having challenges or my mood and affect is starting to shift and she is able to provide insight as to what her and the family are seeing uh, if I'm having trouble explaining or seeing it and, and seeing her input as an equal and, and acknowledging her presence. And that, particularly in the veteran world, uh, her being treated as just my spouse, um, boy, that makes things worse. I identify with the word disabled because the VA calls me service-connected disabled veteran at 40%. But I, on the back end, I would say my disability doesn't prevent me from putting input in my care. Being. And so there, there is a dichotomy in that. But uh, ultimately, the short version is the VA makes me call myself disabled. Mark Willits. I grew up on a farm in Iowa. And when I was 16 years old, I was unloading a trailer with a bunch of plywood. And I unstrapped a bunch of plywood and it fell on top of me and gave me a C3 spinal cord injury. So I'm paralyzed from the shoulders down. I have no feeling or movement below my shoulders. You can't really see, but shrugging my shoulders is the lowest muscle that I can move. After I was hurt, I was in ICU for about 
three weeks, and then I went to Craig Hospital, which is in Denver, Colorado, for about four months to do rehab. And while I was in rehab, I learned all the skills I needed to learn to live life with a spinal cord injury, from managing my tracheostomy and ventilator to managing my suprapubic catheter to dealing with wheelchair equipment and other medical equipment and navigating the health insurance industrial complex and all the other parts of dealing with a, you know with the healthcare system and living with a spinal cord injury they've reimbursed about $3000 out of $27000 but they basically said we don't we're not going to pay it's not a medical necessity we didn't have proof that it was your old chair was broken and you know excuse after excuse so that's one of the terrible stories of the healthcare system. Try to continue my life as planned as much as I could while living with a spinal cord injury. So I went to Iowa State University for about two years and studied computer engineering and finished law school in 08, practiced disability law in Los Angeles for about nine years. We, have, we opened a small meditation studio and my wife is also a mental health therapist. So I'm trying to start a little small business and to see what else we can do in the world. We have a two and a half year old daughter. And so that was another reason to move was to have an easier, simpler life in Arizona. I, I do identify as a person with a disability and I am proud of it and own it. I, it's kind of like uh, other people and other discriminated groups that have decided to, you know, reclaim the power of their identity and reclaim their group. Whether Hello, I'm Delyn. I'm deaf, from a deaf family, which means that my parents are deaf, and I'm actually the fifth generation of, um, of coming from a deaf family. I have three daughters. One is deaf and two is hearing. I was actually quite surprised when my daughter was born hearing. At first, I didn't really know how to handle it, but um, we were great. And I am now actually the grandmother of two deaf grandchildren. <clears throat> I currently work as a certified deaf interpreter here in the Tucson area. And I will travel throughout the state to do my work depending on the needs. I work in various settings, sometimes in the healthcare settings, also mental health, legal, courthouse settings. I also work in jails and prisons. Part of my work takes me to ASDB, the deaf school here in town. And I also work with the University of Arizona. I interpret different classes depending on the semester. I absolutely love my work and I love seeing communication access happen for both the deaf and hearing communities in the state. It's a two-way street. The challenges that I have faced so far working with the healthcare system are varied. Sometimes when I call the doctor's office to make an appointment for myself, they will tell me that I need to bring my own interpreter with me. And then it takes a moment of education that they are actually responsible for providing that interpreter. And that is a protection under the American with Disabilities Act. So I take the time to explain that it's actually their responsibility and quite often, they just don't know. Another problem that I run into is that doctor offices actually will not provide interpreters for me. They tell me that I must find a doctor who will. Again, this is a violation of the ADA. And having your patients then look around town for, office, for doctor's offices who will provide the interpreter, provide an interpreter is discrimination. Often I will call ahead of time to confirm that my appointment has an interpreter, and they will confirm it, but once I arrive to the appointment, they're actually not there. And so then that means I am in the position of having to reschedule. I don't see myself as disabled. I am able to do whatever I please. I can drive, I can marry, have children, go to school, attend university, really anything. The disability really comes into play 
when hearing people who don't know how to sign can't communicate with me. They're the ones that need the interpreters. Thank you very much.